You are listening to a free version of Majority Report with Sam Steeter. To support the show and get another 15 minutes of daily program, go to majority.fm, please. The Majority Report with With Sam Sam Steeter. It is Wednesday, March 8th, 2017. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the four-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today... Author Nelson Dennis, author of The War Against All Puerto Ricans, Revolution and Terror in America's Colony, stays after the 100-year celebration of, I guess, when Puerto Ricans got their citizenship, really just more like celebrating 100 years of exploiting Puerto Rico. Many respects, maybe a vision for America. Also on the program today, the country is asking if even Paul Ryan wants to pass this so-called repeal and replace Obamacare bill. It's really looking like one of those things where You know, they have everybody in the firing line shoot, some with blanks, some with bullets, so you don't know who to blame when that person gets killed. Well, in this instance, who will we blame when the Republicans don't kill Obamacare? Meanwhile, WikiLeaks exposes a massive trove of CIA spy tools Trump's wall for border security going to be paid for by Mexico? No. Going to be paid for by cuts from other security of our borders. Healthcare, schmelthcare. This healthcare bill, it's about tax cuts and lottery winners, ladies and gentlemen. Got to focus on the lottery winners. It is International Women's Day, and strikes occurring across the country. The EPA Science Office revamps their mission statement to exclude science. And Clinton's ads, it appears, after research, were policy-free. An ongoing problem the Democratic resistance to Donald Trump. Frankly, the predictable ongoing problem to the resistance uh, to Donald Trump. All this and more on today's program, ladies and gentlemen. Um, obviously, a uh, we got a little bit of counter-programming. You know, this is something that um, I have struggled with in the, uh, the Trump era. We could avoid having a guest every day. Um, Or we could simply have on reporters to talk about the various aspects of this administration. I haven't even talked about, you know, whatever the latest uh, uh, Russia intrigue is. But we want to... Uh, continue to maintain the integrity of this show, and by that I mean the integrity to its original uh, format, which is to bring important stories that um, aren't necessarily tied to the news of the day, maybe to the week or the month of the year. And um, and so we will uh, we will obviously. And I know yesterday uh, Michael spoke to uh, Michael Schur about the um, the affordable, the American health, whatever they, whatever that garbage is that they call that, that that tax cut basically, um, and we're going to cover that on a more uh, uh, going forward. Although I am, 
of the mind that there was never, ever a plan on behalf of the Republicans to pass this legislation. I think this legislation was designed to have so many um, so many poison pills in it that um, it was to never pass. And uh, David Dayen has a um, has a piece up, basically predicting that this will not pass, and that what's going to happen is going forward, you're just going to have the Health and Human uh, Services Secretary Tom Price use his ability as HHS Secretary to change rules which continue to degrade the Affordable Care Act, at least in the context of the individual markets, and then and punt. It's a punt. It's a huge punt. And the real question is going to be, um, will, will Republicans pay a price for it? But the danger is, is that Democrats are simply standing back and asking that question and then doing nothing else. And that's a real problem because there's no proactive agenda that, that's being put out there. And that's not enough. And it's not enough, as the Clinton campaign showed us, it's not enough to remind everybody that Donald Trump is a horrible human being. I mean, I've been complaining for now, first with the Clinton campaign and now with the Democrats in la at large. They are not taking the fight to Paul Ryan and Mitch McConnell. And this is this is... I mean, it's scary. It's just going to mean there's going to be more outside um, organizing. And, you know, polling has been released uh, that shows that uh, Donald Trump is historically, is at a historic unfavorables. The Republican Party also, maybe not historic, but significant unfavorables. The Democrats, even more unfavorable. People don't like Democrats. And they have to go out there and uh, do something, I think, uh, more proactive. There's going to be a lot of opportunity, I think, for primaries in this environment for Democrats. And so hopefully we're going to see um, a lot of outside organizing to primary a lot of these Democrats. I mean, this is this is the environment for it. And hopefully the threat of that will will push them forward. I mean, here is uh, let's just play one clip. And I enjoyed this clip because um, the moment the Republicans released their plan, I tweeted out something to the effect of how many pages are in it, because that's the only metric that 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 is meaningful. And it, of course, it was a joke. It was a joke based upon my experience going down to that 928 or whatever it was years ago, a Tea Party Glenn Beck rally in Washington D.C. And I interviewed probably about 60 people there. Two-way person. They all complained about the size of the Affordable Care Act bill, that it was just so big. And they all, uh, many of them wanted to make uh, the bills less than 10 pages long <clears throat> as, a, as a rule or law. <laughs> Some maybe said, well, there could be, you know, exceptions. And so I, I tweeted out that joke. And even in my wildest joke dreams, did I not, uh, uh, did I uh, conceive of this moment? Look at the size. This is the Democrats. This is us. There is, I mean, th you can't get any clearer in terms of this is government, this is not. Um, and I think that part of the reason the visual is important is that when you actually look at the difference, 
you realize this is what big government does. It makes <laughs> stacks of papers that are seven times larger than other stacks of papers. Don't you think, actually, ironically, when you watch the Sean Spicer, doesn't your inner Republican get kicked on? You're like, are my tax dollars actually going to fund this guy? This I, moron on the, TV with the, stacks the of awesome paper? The awesome part was there was a moment, we should go back to it in a second, because there was a moment in the middle where he was sort of like, his physicality, where he was trying to show the, there was a real sort of, like, um, remember that uh, British guy with the funny sweaters who's always like, this machine will juice for you and you will feel healthy and vibrant right, 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 right around there. Like where he, he's not sure if he should leave the podium. The Democrats, yeah. this is us. There is, right I mean, there, that you part. can't yeah. get any clearer yeah. in terms Look of it. this is government, this is not. Um, and I think that part of the reason... And believe me, when you bring this home, you're going to find that washing the floor is done like in a snap. You're going to find that this is government so, and this is not government. And the fact that that small stack of pages, apparently 66 pages, six of those pages dedicated to making sure that uh, lottery winners are, do not stay on Medicaid. We'll get to that later. But... I think this type of theater is really the only reason why they came out with this bill. It's going to die, and then they're just going to hope that their, um, their voters forget about it. And you know what? I think their voters will. I don't think they cared about policy ever. Maybe they'll just do a resolution. We're not going to call it Obamacare anymore. We're going to call it the American Health Care Act. Uh, I haven't seen a clip for it yet, but Kellyanne Conway this morning said uh, Trump doesn't wasn't like, hey, I want my name on this thing. Right. I want it de-blacked. Yeah. I want it de-blacked. There you go. Sick. White health care. White That's care. what we're going to call it. We're, we're just going to call, call it white, white health care. Uh, maybe Trump care actually is better than white care. <laughs> uh, it's just a thought. Let's see how it does. If it wins, Trump care. All right. We're going to take a quick break. Uh, when we come back, we'll be talking to Nelson Dennis on... The hundred years of American citizenship Puerto Ricans have, I guess, enjoyed would be uh, a little bit more than, um, than appropriate, or I should say uh, accurate. We'll be right back after this. We are back. Sam Cedar on the Majority Report on the phone. It's a pleasure to welcome back to the program Nelson Dennis. He's the author of War Against All Puerto Ricans, Revolution and Terror in America's Colony. And he has uh, written a piece in The Nation magazine. After a century of American citizenship, Puerto Ricans have little to show for it uh, indeed. 
So it was 100 years ago, uh, just about four days ago, uh, Dennis, that one million yeah. Puerto Ricans were granted United States citizenship. Yeah, uh, about a little over, uh, a little over, about one point, well, about one and a half million. And um, it was very timely because it was on March 2nd, 1917. And then Woodrow Wilson sent his declaration of war uh, to Congress exactly a month later. And oh, close to 20,000 Puerto Ricans were then drafted into into the war um, just a month later. And I mean, was that the, was that, how, how much of the uh, incentive to grant citizenship to Puerto Ricans was, was that uh, part of it? Or was that simply a, a coincidence or was that more about the timing than the actual move? Well, you know, I mean, there, there is that, right? You can also, one can always say, well, you know, just things happen. But if you sort of reverse engineer your way in, into what, 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 through what happened later, there's a series of cases, Supreme Court cases called the Insular Cases, re regarding Puerto Rico as an island. Um, the net result of which uh, found that Puerto Rico, under the territorial and supremacy clauses of the United States, that was not entitled to the privileges and immunities of the U.S. Constitution. So therefore, those returning soldiers, the ones that shot and got shot at, the ones that managed to, to not get killed, when they come back to Puerto Rico, they weren't eligible, for instance, for a minimum wage because the privileges and immunities of the Constitution did not apply to Puerto Rico as a territory. So then you ask yourself, so then what was this citizenship about? So that's why I'm saying kind of like reverse engineer. If... If it was about, in fact, giving, you know, inclusiveness and bringing Puerto Ricans into the American community, then why did you give them a second class citizenship when they would come back and then during the Great Depression be working for starvation wages? How much of a citizenship? So um, it just remind people about the relationship between uh, Puerto Rico and the United States. I mean, I, you know, I think people forget because it's sort of, it, you know, a hundred years later, it's really hard to wrap your head around the idea that Puerto Ricans don't vote for the president of the United States, that they are basically, yeah. I mean, they're really, I mean, in this day and age, they're, Puerto Rico is really treated like a, a, a colony would be a hundred years ago or 200 years ago. Yeah, uh, and it's actually um, a, it's a matter of black letter law. It's, it's not just sort of like a, a subjective feeling. It's it's actually um, that's exactly the relationship because last year in on June 9, 2016, under a Supreme Court case called U.S. v. Sanchez Valle, the Supreme Court re well the Obama administration argued through its, its solicitor general and the Supreme Court agreed. They reiterated that Puerto Rico as a territorial possession of the United States is not, does not have any political and juridical sovereignty whatsoever. And therefore really it remains under the, under the plenary jurisdiction of U S Congress. So a hundred years later, last year, and, and I, I give that date because actually it's pretty significant on June 9th, the, uh, the, the, the executive branch of the federal government argued to the judicial branch and the judicial branch agreed. And on that same day, the legislative branch, Congress, passed the PROMESA bill, which created the Financial Control Board. Now, that's one, another one of those, that sort of celestial alchemy that we can call a coincidence. When I'm, all three branches of the federal government agree on the same day that Puerto Rico is a territorial possession. Now, what complicated it, Sam, in the middle of that, the United States was engaged in a Cold War in the 50s, and it could ill afford to have a classic colony and project itself as the leader of the free world vis-a-vis -vis Russia. So it would have to resolve that in some way. They created this hybrid relationship called the Commonwealth. In Spanish, it's ELA, Estado Libre Asociado, Freely Associated State, which is kind of a misnomer because Puerto Rico is not free. It's not a state. It's not, it doesn't really have the powers of, of associations. But it, it worked because it allowed Puerto Rico, to, uh, the United States, to go to the decolonization committee of the UN and say, well, you see, Puerto Rico is not a colony, it's a commonwealth, and they took it off the, the, uh, the decolonization list, off the watch list, and so the United States could, you know, project itself again as, as the leader of the free world. However, that was in 1952 that they created this. 
all along, people understood that there was basically no change in the relationship between the United States and Puerto Rico. And that was affirmed last year, with the Supreme Court uh, case that I told you. I'll give you one example of what this colonial relationship, how it plays out economically. There's a law that's uh, Section 27 of the Merchant Marine Act of 1920, which is also known as the Jones Act, under which Puerto Rico is specifically prohibited, under that and under the Foraker Act, Puerto Rico is under, specifically prohibited from engaging in its own international trade relations. And under the Jones Act, only U.S. goods, only U.S. vessels that are owned, operated, and chartered in the U.S. are allowed to come into Puerto Rico and, and, and carry goods. Any foreign registry vessels have to pay enormous taxes and fees and quotas, the net result of which is the a price fix fixed system for all U.S. goods to come to Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico, 80% of the goods consumed in Puerto Rico are from the U.S., and they all cost about 20% more than they otherwise would have because of the price rigging from the Jones Act. And that's costing Puerto Rico about $45 billion a year. If it weren't for the Jones Act, there would be no debt. There would be, we wouldn't have this public debt of Puerto Rico that created the uh, the financial control board. Just well, that's in, an example. That, just in that terms of the Jones Act, nineteen twenty. Just in yeah. terms of that Jones Act. So give us a sense of like, okay, so in uh, just so that people can compare here in New York, uh, for instance, we obviously have vessels that come from around the world come into uh, New York Harbor, um, and presumably then. Uh, get offloaded, and uh, we can uh, we can whatever it is, eat those things or uh, buy those things yeah. or whatever it is. Um, <laughs> and so, I mean, and in Puerto Rico, you can't get it directly from where it's being shipped to. I mean, from right. There's two issues, and there's two issues in there. You just hit one um, that we can eat what's on up here in in New York State. We can also negotiate the the prices. Puerto Rico is specifically prohibited from from negotiating its own prices from what comes off those boats. So what happens with the Jones Act is a foreign registry vessel can come into Puerto Rico, but it has to pay a steep set of taxes, duties, import, uh, quotas, the the net result of which is that everything that's on that boat, no matter what it is, a car, food, medicine, clothing, ends up costing about 20% more because the cost gets passed on onto the consumer. So that's if the foreign registry vessel comes directly to Puerto Rico. It has an option. It can go to specifically to Jacksonville, Florida, where the goods get offloaded, the original foreign registry vessel, and reloaded onto a U.S. boat. And that, that U.S. boat then reroutes back to Puerto Rico. So that's the equivalent of, of digging a ditch and filling it up again. If they you know, reroute the boat, take it off one boat, put it on another boat, bring it into Puerto Rico. And again, the, the net result is that all those goods end up costing roughly about 20% more. What this does for the U.S. is it allows U.S. corporations to slightly underprice, and this is the biggest, the biggest piece here. They can therefore come slightly under because they know what the manifest, what the costs are going to be coming off those foreign registry vessels. So then they can just, co- just come in a little bit under. And Puerto Ricans are very price sensitive. The per capita income in Puerto Rico is slightly over $15,000 per capita which is about half that of, poor, of Mississippi, the poorest state of the union. So if they can save a little money, they, they have to, they will. So that's what, the, what, the, what this price rigging does. It allows, as an example, the same car in Miami costs $6,000 more in San Juan because of this situation. And let so me just be clear here. With, if if, if yeah. that car had come directly from, uh, mm-hmm. I don't know, uh, South Korea, that car would cost... $6,100 more. But because it's looped through uh, Jacksonville, Florida, they'll just jack up the price to 6000 and that's the way they maintain their competitive advantage over the, the, the one coming directly from Korea, which would have to pay all these fees. Yeah, I'm not sure the, the math that we just used here. Uh, let me just th- th- throw in a, let's say something will cost, um, something will cost 100 bucks. Some used car will, co- will cost 100 bucks. From a from a foreign source, but because they have to put it through all uh, all these other machinations, Jacksonville, or coming directly, it ends up costing say a hundred twenty bucks. So it just they've added twenty percent of the cost. Mm-hmm. So a car that that costs six thousand dollars more 
It's about 20% of, of the cost because the, co- the car would cost about, say, $24,000 as opposed to $18,000, whatever that, to- that 20% differential is. So it's just any good that, come, that would come in, roughly it costs about 20% more if it comes from a foreign, from a foreign source. And the United States just comes slightly under that. They figure right. out ways to just charge 18%. It's, it's for that reason that there's more Walgreens and Walmarts per square mile in Puerto Rico than anywhere else on the planet. And they're, all, and they're selling goods at these hyperinflated prices. And it is that that, is, that put a huge, that plus the inability because they're prohibited from developing their own shipping industry, which is a foundational industry for an island. I mean, you got right, you got to import, you got to right. export. But if you can't control your own shipping industry or negotiate your own trade relations or, or have any input on the consumer prices, then you're completely a captive economy. So what's happened is that Puerto Rico has been uh, prohibited from developing its own, really, its own private economy. The public sector has become the largest employer. And that's where we got into this financial mess, because the government basically has been the largest employer in Puerto Rico, and it racked up very large debt over the last 15 years. And that's where Wall Street has been able to take advantage of it. All right. I want to get into that. And I want to get into uh, what this FCB, which was set up, and you mentioned uh, you mentioned this um, uh, Puerto Rican Oversight Management and Economic Stability Act. Um, this FCB is sort of, um, I'd say it's reminiscent of what we're seeing, let's say, in a, in a state like Michigan with these uh, emergency financial city managers but uh, it's not like it's displacing um, a full sovereignty anyways in uh, Puerto Rico, because as you said, there's a lot of things that are taken off the table. But broadly speaking, and well, let's, let, let, let's just use the example that you do here of Charles Herbert Allen, because I think in some ways that his example um, really is, 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 a, is, is illustrative of not just how the relationship started, but what the relationship has been, right? I mean, we're just like, yeah. Puerto Rico is basically just, uh, wealth is just consistently extracted there for the benefit of a rather small group of people in this country. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, and it, 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 for people that... I understand this. As a Puerto Rican, this is something that's near and dear to me because I have family there. I go in and out. I, I understand fully how it's, it's difficult for people to focus because this is an island that's basically 1,500 miles away from New York. So it's separated by an ocean, a language, and essentially a century of propaganda. And, you know, and, and today with the news cycle that we have with, you know, with this circus in Washington, it's pretty difficult. I, I understand that how, how people we get one hot minute for people to you know look at Puerto Rico, and it's basically when there's a, a financial crisis, then the media will will pay attention, but they'll do it in the most broadest in the broadest terms, and they won't understand the the underlying dynamics. So, as an example, Charles Robert Allen, he was a template. He comes in. He was the first civilian governor of Puerto Rico in in 1901. He barely was there for one year, and he left, ran up to Wall Street. And he became the, uh, a vice president of Morgan Guarantee Trust. And he became a treasurer, then president, then chairman of the board of the American Sugar Refining Company, based upon all his contacts in Puerto Rico, because he put about 600 expatriate U.S. expats into the Puerto Rican bureaucracy, who gave him all sorts of uh, land concessions, land grants, riparian rights, sole source contracts, railroad easements. They made it very easy for Charles Robert Allen to create himself a, a sugar empire. Puerto Rico was first perceived in 1898 uh, as for the geopolitical value of being a naval coaling station because of good outposts in the Caribbean. But people like Charles Robert Allen thought, hey, holy, got something else here. We have a tremendous climate, tremendous soil, cheap labor. The hell with that. Let's turn this place into a, a, a huge sugar plantation. And that's what they did. Within thir- by 1930, 80% of the, of the land under cultivation in Puerto Rico was owned by U.S. banking syndicates. You know, so how does that happen? How do people lose or get disappropriated from their land in, in 30 years? Um, and so it is that radical divestiture that occurred. It's sort of like the uh, Naomi Klein shock doctrine. Things happen really quickly. And an, an imposing culture comes in and figures out ways of separating people from their land. And once that happened, Puerto Rico has been in a, com- a continuing cycle of dependency 
and also creating great profit for the United States. I'll give you two examples. One, I just we just mentioned the Jones Act. Puerto Rico is the fifth largest market for U.S. goods in the whole world, and as I as I said, more WalMarts and Walgreens than than anywhere else. Secondly, it's a it's an enormous tax haven. Uh, there's people there like John Paulson who are getting 20-year tax abatement deals that pay no interest dividend or capital gains income, and they own resort complexes. Uh, John Paulson owns the AIG building in Atorrey. He owns 8.5% of Banco Popular, the largest bank in Puerto Rico. And they just come in, and they avail themselves of the, of the economy in, in a privileged way. Meanwhile, Puerto Ricans themselves are being taxed to death to pay for the, the fact that the government – is, is running out of money. It's officially going to run, run out of money in about two months. Puerto Rico, they were hit with 105 in the year 2013. 2013, they raised 105 different taxes were raised in, in Puerto Rico. The, the electricity rates per kilowatt hour are three times what we pay here in New York. They pay about 28 cents per kilowatt hour. Water rates have risen by 60%. This is, uh, so Puerto, Puerto Rico has been in this position basically quietly supporting the U.S. economy. But up here, the way the media reported is that, whoa, Puerto Ricans are getting food stamps and they're not paying a federal income tax. Basically, they're they're living off of us, which is very much not the case. But that is the narrative and that's the misinformation that's developed over, over 100 years. And now this financial control board is not there to, uh, to uh, reinstate or, or develop the Puerto Rican economy. It's just basically a collection agency for these hedge funds. What's going to happen is they're going to privatize the, the infrastructure of Puerto Rico. Uh, they're going to do it with highways, prisons, schools, uh, any uh, physical infrastructure. Goldman Sachs has a 50-year lease on PR22 and PR5, the two most profitable highways in Puerto Rico. Mm. That's where that's where things are headed, and again, the American public isn't aware of it. It's basically going to just turn. Uh, it's just it's just more wealth extraction, right? I mean, what uh, what uh, this guy did, Alan did a hundred years ago with uh, sugar. Um, it seems these financiers are now doing with just about every other asset, uh, living assets, uh, people, people's uh, sort of kinetic activity, <laughs> driving, yeah. uh, anything they do to live, they're going to extract wealth from that. Uh, and yeah. uh, the, the, the government itself of Puerto Rico will get nothing. I mean, you know, I, you read this stuff and uh, like you say, we never hear about it in, in our media. And if you're not, I think, if you have no um, direct ties to Puerto Rico, it's just not something that comes up in the in the course yeah, of. Pro- we certainly and that's don't a get, real problem. We certainly I keep don't saying get, that what happens in I say what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. What happens in Puerto Rico never happens at all, and you know that's very suitable to any sort of the neoliberal interests that, that are finding ways of getting their hooks into Puerto Rico, because then they can completely control the narrative up here in the United States. And so, I mean, how does this end? I mean, where are we since uh, this? Just tell us how the the debt crisis supposedly was resolved, I guess. It's just that it's now basically been a big sell-off. Yeah, you know, you you said it really well. Uh, Sam, you, you know, you have, I'll, I'll fill in, <laughs> but, but you just hit it. The way it developed is that yet another one of these uh, tax, corporate tax schemes, that kept Puerto Rico afloat because it has a synthetic economy that is not its own because it's always has to, it's, it's, made, it's been made dependent on foreign capital. There was something called IRS 936. It was an IRS code that gave tax preferences to large, especially high-tech corporations such as pharmaceuticals. And it, it worked. Puerto Rico, until 2006, was producing 25% of the world's pharmaceuticals. That's stuff that we see on TV, you know, with all the you know, the 28 side effects, mm. <laughs> well, 25% was coming from, r- roughly was coming from Puerto Rico, and 90% of U.S. and Canadian pharmaceutical consumption was, from, was, was being produced out of Puerto Rico. In fact, one town, one factory in the town of Barceloneta was producing all of the legal Viagra consumed in the United States. So you know, Puerto Ricans are certainly capable of producing a great deal of joy for their northern neighbors. Um, that, <laughs> 
that was un- that was until 2006, which is when the IRS the 936 lapsed, uh, and so suddenly there was a big financial hole because the pharmaceuticals and the ancillary industries employed about about 100,000 people in Puerto Rico. So now all of a sudden there's this big financial hole, and it coincided with the subprime mortgage meltdown in 2007. So this is where, we, we, if you're familiar with the book uh, Confessions of an Economic Hitman, yes. John Perkins. So this is where the hitman started to come in because they went to Puerto Rico and they said, you know, you guys, you guys have a big gap here, but we have these really good credit instruments. They're triple tax exempt, so they'll be very popular on Wall Street, and we could just do a series of municipal bond financings and keep you keep you guys going. What they did is what that was was injecting Puerto Rico with layers of debt layer upon layer. Some of it was so, so naked that PREPA, the Puerto Rico Electrical and Power Authority, had a series of double uh, A bonds that were issued between 2009 and 2013. Eight, and there's a study, that, and I think I linked it into, in, the, in the article at, in the nation, there's a hyperlink. 82% of those bonds were not paying for electricity, operating or maintenance costs, or even for the payment on principle of antecedent debt. They were paying off the interest on the prior so that was basically a ponzi scheme god how did how people don't go to how did we don't get the justice department how this isn't white collar crime i don't know but that now prepa owes four billion dollars with compounded interest just from from those loans alone let me just ask you this this is what started happening in in 2006 the, the debt started to come in when when they start when when they're when they are servicing their debt, where they're going out and getting new loans to service just the uh, the um, the interest on loans, like is there a is it is it the the guy who who purchases you know those or, or I guess takes those loans in the Puerto Rican government or in the um, uh, the that utility. Is it just simply because they have no other options? I mean, are they aware of the hole that they're being dug? Or is just that there this sense of, I mean, does that guy end up working on Wall Street three years later? Hey, you know, I'm going to give you a great one. There's a guy named Luis Fortuño, who is the prior governor of Puerto Rico. And this is where things get a little gnarly, Sam, because there's a lot of blame to go around. There's people in Puerto Rico, in the government, that basically collaborate and they conspire with this. Luis Fortuño was a governor before Alejandro Garcia Padilla, who just just went out. He was only in one term, four years, from 2009 to 2013, and he issued more debt than even any governor in Puerto Rican history. It was 16.4 billion dollars during the four, four years alone. Nine billion of which is not fully accounted for yet. One billion was for a line item called public relations. I'm, you know, wrap your mind on that. Public relations, a, a, a billion dollars. He had a $400 million gasoducto that, ne- that never got built. A hundred million for a fideicomissimo de, de ciencias, which is a, a commission, a science commission, a, a research and development outfit that never, that never uh, developed and a hundred million went, went missing. So now this guy, Luis Fortunio, while he was in office, his government also spent $23 million on legal fees to Steptoe and Johnson in Washington. Well, Luis Fortuna was now a partner in Johnson. So, you know, I mean, the argument can be made that the guy basically subsidized his own partnership at Steptoe and Johnson with the uh, $23 million tax dollars from, from Puerto Rico. And, he, and uh, Luis prepaid Fortuna his own, was one of the... Prepaid his own prepaid salary. Prepaid his salary. And he created the Public Private Authority Commission, which is and, and started the template of what's called P3s, Public Private Partnerships. But I call them P5s, Public Private Partnerships for the Plunder of Puerto Rico. Because what the, what the FCB, the control board, is going to do is when these debts become fi- fully due and the government can't pay them, because really Puerto Rico is, is cash trapped in about two or three, it already missed a $312 billion million bond payment on February 1st. And it's going to continue to default. So when this happens, the the creditors are logically going to say, okay, well, if we lend money to Prepa, for instance, the electrical, then and you guys can't pay, well, we're going to create a public-private partnership, and now we'll step in and we'll act as the controlling authority. And that's what's going to these debts 
are going to be converted into P3s all over the island. And unless, um, unless something, some radical, there's a paradigm shift over the next five, ten years, what's going to happen, this financial control board is simply going to leave a whole network of P3s that are going to be crisscrossing the entire island that will have essentially mortgaged and privatized the entire public infrastructure of Puerto Rico. They've already sold 300 public schools in the last two months. They've just been ordered by executive order, and they've just cut 300, uh, 350 school, public schools, and they just, or, or issued a $300 million budget cut to the University of Puerto Rico. This is probably antecedent to declaring all those sectors as Privately public owned. private partnerships. Right. Exactly. And so that, that's where, you know, things are just... So this and, is basically... Let me, let me just, uh, just in the context of, let's say, just the Sopranos, right? Um, the IRS code uh, changes. Uh, Puerto Rico is, uh, because of all the systemic and structural reasons why um, they can't um, basically generate money um, on that island, having to do with their inability to have uh, ships come in from foreign ports, just unbelievable. So they're, they're short on cash. They're basically forced to go to a, a loan shark. Uh, the loan sharks come in. And that, they load and up. The they load up on the debt, and uh, they know uh, ultimately these guys can't pay. So it's instead of we're going to break your kneecaps, what we're going to do is we're going to take anything on your island that makes you money, and it's going to be half hours, and that's basically it. Sam, uh, unfortunately. Um, the way you think is very clear, and I think you said it better than, than, than I did. Uh, you said it very, very clearly. And to give you a sense of the, the intent behind it, Senator Jim Young, the chairman of the House Committee on Natural Resources that wrote the Promesa Bill, or the, you know, yep. the, which is actually Orwellian, because Promesa means promise in, in Puerto Rico. When uh, they were discussing the, drafting that bill, a, a uh, congressman suggested uh, a, an amendment to the Jones Act to exempt Puerto Rico from the Jones Act as a way of saying, you know what, if we're trying to, you know, b lift Puerto Rico out of this mess and make it really capable of having a self-sustaining economy so that we're not, it, we're not in this boat 20 years from now, let's deal with the Jones Act. And what Jim Young said is, no, that is non-germane. Those were his words. That is non-germane to this bill. With that, it, he made it very clear. So, so the, the control board is basically all about collecting money from Puerto Rico and converting and, and creating these P3s, but it's not help about developing the economy in, in any meaningful way. It was because it was deemed non germane They didn't even discuss it. So now, you're right, Sam. You got it right. Nelson, let me ask you this. All right. Um, uh, President Obama commuted the sentence of Oscar Lopez um, uh, before he left. Uh, President Obama. And I, I don't know. I mean, I think, you know, I, I was young uh, in the 70s and was not, I think, sort of like fully conscious of 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 the Puerto Rican independence movement and, and the violence associated with it. Um, and uh, and I and I think, you know, largely people, frankly, aren't aware of any of the sort of uh, the, the type of violence that we had in this country in the 70s and the 80s in terms of like political violence. But when you hear a story like this, it really does make you wonder, you know, wh how is there not more? I mean, how do we not have a, uh, a Puerto Rican independence movement that is uh, not more violent at this point? I mean, because... There doesn't seem to be, you know, again, we had a brief moment. I don't know. Uh, it was around the time that we had you on the program, I guess, maybe six to eight months ago. Maybe it was a year ago. I can't even remember now uh, mm -hmm. because of this uh, election. But where people contemplate Puerto Rico, but it's usually just because it's going to make a huge financial story. And, it, you know, n nobody's quite clear on, on how it resol resolved. I mean, I think you could, add, you could, you could sit every uh, news anchor of every major television program. And I would imagine like none of them are really quite clear on uh, how it was resolved because it's not in the news. I mean, how does this measure of frustration and deprivation not lead to some type of like blowback? Yeah, and actually, you opened up a, a few few doors in that. Um, 
One is which the, the president and uh, very iconic figure, and I'm, I wrote a lot about him in, in my book, was Pedro Albizu Campos, who was the president of the Nationalist Party. And one thing, one of his adages was, the only time the United States will is aware of us is when we become a problem. And that's what happened last year, be, when it became clear that there was exposure on the, in the uh, municipal bond market. The exposure was big, because uh, very quickly, the municipal bond market is $3.7 trillion a year. The American economy, the gross national product, is about $17 trillion a year. So you divide 3.7 to 17, that's about 20 to 22 percent. So in any given year, about 20 to 22 percent of the American economy is being filtered through these municipal bond instruments. If Puerto Rico had been allowed to give in Chapter 9 bankruptcy powers and renegotiate its debt, then all 50 states would have suddenly said, hey, wait a minute, right. we wanted to go and read our, our debt portfolio too. So you see, Puerto Rico, in a sense, was staring down up the rifle barrel of the entire capitalist system. And frankly, there was no way that they were going to extend any bankruptcy relief to Puerto Rico. So Puerto Rico is really on, on, on its own. It has to issue triple tax-exempt bonds with an incredible upside, but it can't protect itself on, on the downside. Now, what a, 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 the violent response is a kind of a recognition that, you really can't militarily defeat the United States. All right? When push comes to shove, um, you know, uh, you know, you can try, but you have you've had FBI infiltration in Puerto Rico. Right. You had a carpeta system that created a hundred over a hundred thousand secret, undisclosed FBI files on Puerto Ricans for a period of, of five decades. There was a law, La Ley 53, it was a, called La Ley de la Mordaza, a muzzle law issued in 1948. By the way, the same year that uh, George Orwell published in uh, 1984. Well, Orwell was alive and well in 1948, because under that law, you couldn't say a word, sing a song, whistle a tune against the United States, or even own a Puerto Rican flag, because it was a felony punishable by, by 10 years. Mm. So under those circumstances, and there was a massacre, by the way, a Ponce massacre, where they, they killed 19 people in broad daylight on Palm Sunday. We have a population that's been, you know, very strongly uh, been, been kept in, in place. Its leaders, its patriots, patriots were jailed, and, and some of them were tortured in prison. And then there's also, um, Sam, there's this, there's, there's this kind of uh, paradoxical escape hatch. Since Puerto Ricans are citizens, one thing they can do is vote with their feet. And that's part of what's happened over the last 15 years. When, when their backs are against the wall and they just can't make it, it the, exp the explosion sometimes doesn't happen because they just moved to Orlando. There's right. now 800,000 Puerto Ricans living in Orlando. So there, you know, there's all these uh, uh, there's all these factors that have made it dip difficult. It's sort of, it's, in a sense, it's been almost subliminal. You know, Puerto Ricans, uh, uh, it's quite a little bit like a frog. And I said, you know how you you supposedly a frog, you put him in warm water, right? And since he's cold blooded, you bring you raise the heat, raise the heat slowly. I think that's part of what, uh, what's, what's been happening here. And uh, I, what's, I think this coming year, though, with the Financial Control Board, there's going to be a, a sort of a quantum leap in the kind of austerity measures. Hmm. And I think that we may, this year, this coming one or two years, may be a time when you're going to see, there's going to be some drastic things happening in Puerto Rico. So, uh, and, and is there, I mean, what can mainland Americans do? I mean... Other than, I guess, look for a candidate who is talking about it. I mean, Bernie Sanders uh, probably spoke more about uh, Puerto Rico than any yeah. presidential candidate since probably Carter, I would imagine. I would think, you know, um, John uh, McCain in Arizona has repeatedly submitted a Jones Act reform bill, which mm -hmm. it would have include Puerto Rico. So I think one thing that, you know, you, you do what's possible, you know, you don't sort of shoot for the moon and. Um, statehood is gonna is a long is a, that's a whole other discussion, Sam. You know, I, I, it'll, I, it'll take like 15 minutes, but it's it, that's I don't think that would happen anytime soon. The United States, I don't think the Congress, a Republican Congress, won't go for it. Right. But the Jones Act, that reform is is at, is there. It's on the table, and it would even benefit the American taxpayer, it would be the Joe, the average Joe who's paying these taxes, some of which are going into Puerto Rico, because the only people benefiting from this Jones Act are very thin slice of corporate executives. Right. Those are the uh, the loan sharks, essentially, who are um, 
who are going in and preying off of Puerto Rico's inability to raise its own funds. And so, you know, you got a vulnerable mark there and uh, you can charge them, uh, you know, whatever it is, the functional equivalent of 50 percent interest. And you don't want that guy to be uh, to have, a, a you know, a job that's going to allow him to pay you back and to uh, move forward. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, Sam, I could talk about tax code revisions and um, a, uh, environmental measures in Puerto Rico and many other things. But you can understand that we need to keep to keep KISS. We need to keep this simple because right. the American public, it's, in all fairness, they're going to they have too many things. So I would say just focus on this one thing, the Jones, Jones Act. Act over and over the Joe. And and that would have a massive uh, significance in Puerto Rico. Nelson Dennis, uh, the book is War Against All Puerto Ricans, Revolution and Terror in America's Colony. And we will link to uh, your piece in the Nation magazine after a century of American citizenship. Puerto Ricans have little to show for it, I'll say. Uh, Nelson, thanks so much for your time today. really appreciate it. I appreciate it, too. Thank you, Sam. All right, folks. Going to take a uh, quick break, head into the uh, fun half wherein uh, we will talk about, um, finally, those lottery winners. God, they've been getting away with murder, well, ladies like and gentlemen. They're like Puerto Ricans. They're just they sucking have, off of the largesse. It's unbelievable. Finally, in the Affordable Care Act, the so-called Affordable Care Act, <laughs> how, much, how much lottery reform was involved in that? Zero. How obscene... Uh, I mean, I, I don't know. I was just flashing back during that interview to the news coverage in 2016 of Puerto Rico, and it just made my blood boil all over again. So, I mean, it really was covered. Like, oh, look at this profligate little island. I guess we'll go in there and whip them into shape. Right. That's disgusting. Yeah, no, it's nice. They're there for, um, you know, they're, it's basically just a, a pool of money that uh, only... Only a narrow group of people in this country have access to, and they're going to make sure that they can maintain that access by keeping. Uh, it's it's it's, it's like I, you know it's like one of those scenarios where it's like you've got a uh, a slave that you don't want to feed too much because you don't want them strong enough to run away, but you need to feed them enough so that they can do work for you. The pharaoh created the slavery diet. <laughs> And it was the perfect diet that allowed Abraham Abraham to deliver the message from the Pharisees. So Puerto Ricans are thinking to themselves, in 3,000 years when there's a moon colony, they're going to be in a great position for that. I think we need to think a little bit more positively. Actually, you know what it is? It's like The Expanse. It's like The Expanse. So I'm watching that, uh, that show on sci-fi, and it is now that I mentioned Maybe that's where I got that idea from. Did you from, know that the, the expanse, human brain, the belters. if we drilled a hole in the back of your skull stem, Sam, you would be able to write that show before you even saw it. <laughs> um, uh, we will talk about the, um, the, the, the affordable American health care or whatever they're calling this uh, Trump care. I don't even think they, they I think they were like, you know what, just put any name on there because we're not going to pass this. This is just going to be uh, the way that everybody can blame everybody else. And if everybody's to blame, then nobody's to blame. So it's your fault, Bill, of 2017. Right. I just call it the CYA. You guys just didn't get it together. It's pathetic. Um, but the only, the only fly in that ointment is going to be Trump, I think, at some level. Because he doesn't, I don't think he, he gets, I don't think he gets any of it. And I think he's just going out there saying, like, well, we're going to do this. And I've seen reports that, like, the Koch brothers and Club for Growth and all of these organizations are supposedly livid. We need to get rid of this. And I just think that mm, I don't buy it. I think they are like, whatever. The bottom line is we want the tax cuts. We want the tax cuts. So if you need to do the, you know, and that's what this bill, of course, does. Well, like I said, we'll talk more about it in the uh, fun half. But that's what this bill does. I mean, there are taxes imposed. And one of the things that, look, the Affordable Care Act was a couple of things. It was not necessarily 
a way to get health insurance cheaper for everyone. It got it cheaper for some people. Generally, uh, people who were poorer or sicker got cheaper health insurance than they would have in the absence of the, of the Affordable Care Act. For people who are not, and I'm talking about people in the individual uh, marketplace, people who are younger and healthier, they may have paid a little more. But primarily, the Affordable Care Act was a, ba a patient's bill of rights, saying that insurance has to actually do what most of us conceive insurance does, like cover us if we're hit by a bus, cover us if we have cancer, not kick us off the program uh, because, oh, our cancer treatments cost too much this year, you're done. So it was a patient's bill of rights. And then the other part of it was, it was basically a massive redistribution program, like all of our government is in many respects. Um, and sometimes we redistribute the wealth upwards, and sometimes we distribute it downwards uh, on the uh, income and wealth scale. And in this instance, there were taxes imposed upon people who were making more than $250,000 as a couple, more than $200,000 as an individual, uh, there was taxes on capital gains, uh, taxes that was increased as well, one or two percentage points, to pay for the expansion of Medicaid. They want that money back. And this bill, one-third of the savings of this bill, and by savings I mean tax cuts, Right. Yeah, I mean, they're not, not exactly. There's saving. not. It's not exactly savings. It's tax cuts. Will go to a I don't know three percent, two percent of taxpayers. Yeah, I think it's even lower than three percent. Maybe it's these, maybe these it's people are like up at night. Like the, the change in my couch might go to give a kid medicine. I can't take no, it. Absolutely. And they're sociopaths. And they. And so even if this bill fails, they will get that money. They will figure out another way. Maybe it'll be the next one. They'll, 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 they'll get it back somewhere else. But I just don't see how this bill is going to get passed. No one seems to like it except for Sean Spicer. And I think that's because he's maybe has back problems. Look so at bad. the pages. This one's big. This one's small. I honestly think Katrina Pearson would be way better than Sean Spicer. Well, it's not. It's total racism we still that have she time. doesn't have a job. We, we, we still have time. Well, apparently she's been rebuffed. We'll, we'll also talk about um, this WikiLeaks. Um, I, I'll be honest with you. I just don't. Um, outside of the top line, which is that there were something like 8,800 documents uh, and files that supposedly came from the CIA's Center for Cyber Intelligence. And, and apparently they have more. Basically outlines how the CIA has been cracking, getting into your phone and even your smart TV's system before anything gets encrypted. So it's not even like breaking something like Signal. It's just that it's there before it gets to Signal uh, as you, uh, you text. And I don't know. Supposedly this stuff was floating around in certain circles out there that were not the CIA, which is also sort of rather disturbing. Privatized intelligence? privatized intelligence or maybe they're just you know they give it to contractors and somebody's like hey bill <laughs> check this out we can you know that uh, you know how you always wanted money to start that uh that uh organic uh, um uh, mushroom farm that you wanted to build i just figure out how we can do that that's so benign <laughs> yeah, i like yeah, that no, these well, contractors I just want to get off the grid man i just want some fu money to go out and make that farm in vermont that i've always wanted or, or do you remember the uh, remember the story? I, I, I said it like right at the beginning. I said that the, one of the most sort of like disturbing immediate effects of these programs, like with the NSA surveillance, was the amount of that people are going to use this to stalk people. And then it mm. came out 
I was just that was another thought that I had. Uh, we'll also talk about the the problem that we have that was indicative in Hillary Clinton's uh, campaign, and now we seem we seem to have um, we have scientific proof of an assessment that I kept making over and over again and would occasionally get pushed back on, which is that Hillary Clinton was not running on issues. And in, and even in the primary, she tried to not to run on issues. She was trying to run on her CV. And then by the time, and this was, you know, well, let's go into the fun. It's now. my turn, you old Jew. But I, I just, I, as, as I'm saying this now, I distinctly remember saying two years ago, in, in the summer of 2015, not quite two years, but pretty close, there's going to be a problem with her running on her CV, particularly if it's Donald Trump. Because you can't play on that. You can't play on personalities. You've got to play on on the field of policies. And they didn't want to do that. You and I don't know if it was just incompetence a, or... No, well, look. A winning personality to play Well, I know. Well, that that's is another sad. vector. Yes, but yes, that's true. But uh, you can see what happens when you get a president with a winning personality, but again, <laughs> not playing with no policies. Right. Uh, you get a Barack Obama and you leave a decimated Democratic Party. That's true, though I think in 2012, just strategically, they actually fused personality with a very specific policy critique, which they didn't follow through on, but it was constantly about outsourcing income inequality. So, you know, they actually fused it. There was going to be it. a mortgage. We're going to have a special mortgage committee. There's going to be a mortgage committee. Believe me, it's going to be great. I found out that George W. Bush hacked me. Sick! <laughs> All right, we're going to take a break. Uh, folks, just a reminder. My friend uh, yesterday told me, like, you, you got to say that at the beginning of the show. You always ask for mem- people to become members at the end of the show. you got to do it at the beginning of the show. But my theory was, yes, but... If you're listening to the end of the show, you'd be more apt to want more material. You're already convinced. And so if you're listening to the sound of my voice, for gosh sakes, and you have the financial means to become a member, why not become a member? You know you want maybe the option on some day of listening. I mean, we just did an hour uh, free for you. Usually it should be 45 minutes. When you see the Jew coming, you must be careful of his teeth. The point being... (laughs) Become a member today, just uh, pennies a day. You must grab it by his body. <laughs> pennies a day, folks. Um, become a member. Join the majorityreport.com. Also, just coffee.coop, fair trade coffee, tea, or chocolate. Use the coupon code MAJORITY. If you buy crap from Jet or Amazon, do it through our link at majorityreportkickback.com. Quick break. We'll be right back after this. Oh, don't forget, April 8th, live at the bell house the bell house the hi bell everyone house. i couldn't remember it i, I know, can't i, I don't block. remember too good uh the bell house live with janine garofalo matt taibbi we'll be right back after this 